Welcome to the 2020 mock trial civic engagement session. In past years, we've incorporated this into the team training, um, but given timing this year and given the new climate that we're working with with Zoom, we thought that it would be a fun uh, change to host the discussion on civic engagement prior to the election, let you hear from a panel of esteemed legal professionals and um, maybe learn something and, and get excited to be involved. So um, as we begin today, I'm going to end up turning it over to them and letting them discuss um, everything related to civic engagement. Um, but I will start with letting you know who we are lucky enough to have here today and then go over um, a little bit of uh, a, a tribute really to Ju Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who uh, recently passed, but most certainly will go down um, in books forever as a pioneer in the civic engagement arena. So uh, we are lucky enough today to have Judge Cook, who you have seen involved in mock trial in the past. He was appointed to the bench in 2007 and sits in Hennepin County. We have Judge Vandalist. Uh, the whole Vandalist family has been around in, in mock <laughs> trial. Um, Judge Vandalist is certainly um, uh, tenured in, in mock trial. He was appointed to the bench in 2014 and is currently sitting in Scott County. We have the wonderful Judge Smith, who we are roping into mock trial, whether he knows it or not. Uh, he was <laughs> recently appointed to the bench in 2015. And then we have a dear friend of mine, Aya Helmy, who is an assistant Ramsey County attorney working in the civil division. Um, why do we have this panel here today? Um, they are um, esteemed, yes. Um, they are personally revered by me, not only for their legal careers and their legal minds, but also who they are as people. Um, I've had the pleasure of um, coming across each of their paths in different scenarios. Um, Judge Vandalist, I was able to shadow him in the courtroom um, and see sentencing hearings and drug court, uh, which was incredibly enlightening. Um, Judge Smith, I remember when we officed in the same building before he was on the mm -hmm. bench and he would let me plop mm -hmm. down in his office and <laughs> ask him about the legal practice. Uh, Judge Cook, I was actually in his courtroom um, as a potential juror uh, in voir dire and my goodness, what a uh, testament to civic duty. Uh, being on the legal side of things, I now understand how non-legal professionals feel during voir dire. And Ea is a classmate of mine who, what does she not know? You know, every time that I have any questions about life in general, she's my first call. So I am thrilled for you to, to learn from all of them today. Um, before we get going, uh, we will um, quickly talk about uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. There's no amount of time that would allow us to pay her enough tribute for what she contributed um, really to our country as a whole. Uh, she um, came to the bench, uh, I believe in 1993, as an associate justice to the U.S. Supreme Court um, and lived through um, what is known to many as multiple landmark and watershed really moments throughout history. Yes, legally speaking, um, but on a larger civil uh, and civic platform as well. Um, interestingly enough, uh, she's always in incredibly composed in any reading or interview that you may um, be able to look back upon and it refers to her time um, as extraordinary, uh, as an extraordinary time to live through. And um, it was interestingly uh, um, insightful to see how she um, addressed the legal profession as a whole and disagreements that people have, which is paramount when looking at civic engagement. Uh, and she mentioned that um, people have the view that because um, an agreement isn't interesting, um, disagreement is interesting, uh, but, but made note that you can more often um, agree than sharply disagree when it comes to uh, looking at things from a starkly legal perspective, but that there's nothing wrong with disagreeing either. We we are all aware that there are many, many perspectives when coming to various legal issues, and that's what makes things so exciting. That's what makes it an honor to have the ability to vote, to have your voice heard, to engage with others, to talk with your families, and to learn. Um, I'm never not learning when it comes to 
uh, voter issues, and just civic engagement in general. Uh, even if it's in my local community, it's something that's really exciting. So as Judge Cook actually put earlier, and I found it fascinating, you know, all of these freedoms that have come before us, um, my freedom to grow up playing hockey, uh, your freedom to run a small business as a young entrepreneur, those nothing, nothing is in granite. Everything can be changed. And that's why your voice is so important for whatever it is that you feel passionately about. So um, the election is coming up. I'm sure that the panel here today will discuss in some, uh, some aspect voting and, and what that means to them and or as a civic engagement activity. But at this point, I will turn it over to um, this esteemed panel uh, and um, thank Justice Ginsburg for everything that she's done for men and women alike um, and look forward to um, continuing to learn from and and hopefully do her proud. So with that, I will turn it over to you. I believe just uh, Judge Vandalist is going to kick it off for us. Well, thanks, Winnie. Um, so inspiring. What you just said is so true on so many different levels. I ironically today was listening to former President Obama at a town hall over the noon hour. And he was talking about the fact that people are, they're, they're, they think that change can't happen. They think that we're stuck where we are. And that if anything, some folks even believe we may be going backwards depending on your viewpoint. But President Obama brought up a great point. He said, you know, talk to people that grew up and lived through the 30s and the 40s and the 50s in this country and ask them if things have changed. And I think that's the perspective we have to take when we're talking about civic engagement. We're in a world right now where we want instant change, instant gratification, and that's not going to happen. You know, I hate to quote President Obama again, but I will. Back when we had our economic crisis, um, you know, uh, eight years ago, and he made a, a reference that's always stuck with me. Sometimes turning society in a direction is like turning a battleship. It's not like turning a motorboat. You have to take the time, the energy, and the engagement to make that change. And so, Civic engagement is so, so important because without it, um, our whole society falls apart. Everything does. And I think most folks that are watching this video will, can say to themselves that they have been given gifts, quite frankly. All of the judges on this panel would agree with me, I think, that we see some pretty horrendous things in our daily work in families and um, the, some of the things that have happened to individuals. And with the gifts that everybody that's watching this has, comes great responsibility to use those gifts to better society. And so my personal feeling is that every day you should go out and make the world a better place for one reason or another, you should do something in your everyday life. So when you go to bed at night and you're laying there, you can say to yourself, you know what? I did this today. Judge Coke, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I do. I, I, I'll even go to a more kind of fundamental level. Um, I have two children. Uh, when my wife and I had our, our first, our son, um, you know, you have all the you know, you want your child to be happy, you want your child to be healthy, you want your child to make contributions and all. We actually made up a list of like little things that we would want. And what was interesting was we both had, I think as number two, be a good citizen. And that seems so odd. I mean, it really does. Um, but we, we both grew up, um, very fortunate with families that loved us and supported us and everything. My wife's dad passed away when she was very little. And so they had some challenges that I didn't encounter. Um, but 
and I knew her since middle school, so like I know this stuff. Um, but we both were very active in community events even then. You know, it's not like you have to put off civic engagement to a certain age. Like you don't have to turn 18 and be like an adult in order to give back and contribute. Um, and I think as students, <clears throat> you're in a really unique situation where you know things that are important to you that maybe those of us who are older have forgotten or never experienced. Like, I hate to tell you, but a few of us on this screen did not grow up with social media. Um, we didn't have, you know, the pressures and the and other things that come from that um, or the, the need or the ability to be connected kind of 24 seven. We've all seen to grow accustomed to that now. But I, I think however you're engaged, whether it's you know, face to face with people, whether it's, you know, working at a food shelf or helping with Special Olympics or whatever kind of something that brings you passion, um, you're able to do that. And I think, you know, don't waste your youth by not thinking of others. <laughs> and that seems kind of odd, uh, perhaps, but you can really make a difference and um and i would encourage you to do that uh judge smith any thoughts and i hate to do it we're doing it kind of i you're gonna be last <laughs> totally fine by me okay i'm just going by the boxes on the screen <laughs> right sure sure well so you know when i think about the idea of um civic engagement uh, when I was a kid, I don't know that I ever used that phraseology. I, I never referred to civic engagement, um, but I always understood that um, I had an obligation to do something outside of myself to try and make um, the world a better place. Um, you know, I think about this concept of civic engagement and, and really what it boils down to is when people um, engage in social, political, or cultural, or economic activities um, at every level of our society, the local, the state level, national level, um, in an effort to make the world a better place for all of us. Um, you know, I, I understood when I went to law school, the reason I went to law school is because I knew innately that I needed to do something that would put me in a position to help make a difference in the world. And I feel very fortunate that um, in all of the years that I practiced, uh, I was able to help a lot of people uh, along the way. And um, I feel very good about that. When I think about young people now, um, I, I have to say, I am just absolutely imp impressed with uh, the engagement that I see amongst a lot of young people, whether we're talking about, you know, young folks who are on the forefront of, of bringing awareness to the issues of global warming and um, uh, trying to get you know, the rest of us to, to focus on um, sustainable energy. Um, uh, you know, I'm so impressed when I see young people who are out leading the charge with respect to, um, you know, trying to change the laws uh, concerning gun ownership. And I understand, you know, not everybody's on the same page. And so uh, whether you are for or against any of this stuff, um, I think it's just incredibly important to be engaged um, and, and, uh, and, and really work at trying to, uh, to make a difference. Um, you know, we're at a point now, uh, you can't miss it unless you, you know, have been hiding in a cave someplace, but, you know, we're, we're at a point in our society where there's a lot of um, social upheaval as a result of some of the things that have happened um, here recently, um, you know, with with the, the the death of George Floyd and um, 
you know, in the pandemic and how that has exposed so much of the inequities that have existed uh, in the society for a long time. Um, and I see young people who are really out um, in the forefront, forefront, trying to uh, trying to deal with some of these uh, these issues, and um, you know, it gives me hope. Uh, that gives me a lot of hope um, because I gotta say, you know, um, the older folks, uh, myself included, those that fall, you know, in my uh, age category, we've done some good things, um, but here lately, boy, we I. We've been dropping the ball, and uh, and and it's the young folks that are going to have to really stay out front and stay engaged in our um, civic environment to to really try to uh, right the ship and and make a difference. And so the fact that um, you know you're viewing this and participating in um, uh, this type of activity suggests to me that um, all of you are going to. Um, you're going to be on the forefront as well. Uh, and you're going to be doing good things, trying to um, make this a better place for all of us. So with that, I will turn over to Aya. All right. Well, um, I have a lot to follow, but uh, <laughs> I think kind of like initially when, when Winnie contacted me about this, uh, I put my political <laughs> science hat on because that was my undergrad major. Um, and I was like, what is really civic, civic engagement? How does it occur, right? Um, and I think that really it's two main ways that we interact with, with civic society. One is, and this is kind of like the, the, the poli sci lingo, it's vertical versus horizontal agitation to make change. And vertical is like through systems. So like you vote because you're in a system that where in which you vote. You um, take a case through uh, all the different levels of, uh, of the courts in order to make precedent that'll, that'll make change in a certain way. Um, and then the horizontal is lobbying, it's protesting, it's um, you know how social media has changed uh, conversations. If we look at the Me Too movement, how that was completely horizontal. It was, you know, they almost abandoned uh, the systems in order to use social media and like the social zeitgeist in order to make change. And so I think it's really important to kind of um, just kind of talk about the fact that there are, there, there's like a, a spectrum basically um, of, you know, solely working within a system, solely working outside a system, and then everything in between. Um, and we all have the ability to do those things at different levels to different uh, um to, to different extents and in different arenas. Um, and so I think that's, you know, something really important. And one thing that uh, the judges spoke about was kind of that choice to engage and, and that calling to engage. And I think that- <laughs> I, I think I'm in the office and we shut down at a certain time. <laughs> so I'll be waving every once in a while to get the lights back on. <laughs> Um, and I, I think that, you know, the younger generation, I mean, every generation has a calling, right, to, to engage in a certain way on certain issues. And I think that the, this younger generation that's coming up, Gen Z, unfortunately, has, has, has thrust upon it mm -hmm. the, the calling that the rest of us had a choice whether or not to take on. Um, you know, issues, issues around um, the economy, issues around race, issues around the environment, um, you know, equity with with uh, the native population, with women. They're they're just like the healthcare system. There really isn't. Uh, uh, there's an abundance of topics and 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 areas and arenas in which young people can engage, just depending on what's what's interesting to them, what's um, what calls them, what their life experience has has pulled them to. Um, but I think that it's, you know, they have an opportunity to completely change our country in, in a way that's incredibly exciting, but at the same time, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Like they have mm -hmm. so much to, to, um, you know, 
take on. And so it, there's so much opportunity, but it's also so overwhelming at the same time. And so um, I think the way to, to interact with that and to react to that uh, overwhelming nature is to do what I think, you know, each one of us has done, <clears throat> which is make change in your little corner of the world, however it is that you can make it. And whatever talents that you have that will address an issue that you see in front of you, that's how you, that's how you make the change. You, you shouldn't say, you know, I'm gonna change whatever X, Y, or Z law at the national level when I'm 16 years old. That's like probably not gonna happen. But what you can do is, you know, start a petition in your school to uh, reduce carbon emissions or, you know, start a recycling program or this, or you know what I mean? Like there are things that, we can all do in our little corners and how do we how do we figure what those things are and it's you know necessity is the mother of invention and so i'm sure that the that the people listening to this have a ton of things that they see could be done better and they just need to to step up and do that can i just pick up on something you were just saying you know it's kind of like an act or think globally act locally kind of a thing but i i wanted to also just note, um, I'll still call myself a middle-aged guy. I might be getting a little higher on the middle age, but in any event. Upper uh, middle age. Well, middle, <laughs> middle, middle, middle age. We'll go with. Um, but what my message to the students is, don't be afraid to share your views. Like I, I love talking <clears throat> students. I love talking, well, I love talking to all kinds of people, but I, I'd like to know what's, what the interests are, what the challenges are. Um, you know, Judge Vanilis talked about how we oftentimes see people at their worst. Um, like I'm on a straight criminal rotation and we get pre-sentence investigation reports and we learn a lot about people. I remember the first few we call them PSIs. The first few PSIs I read, I like, I wasn't fighting back tears. That's making it seem too dramatic. But I mean, there are life stories there that I, nobody can't should have. imagine, can't even imagine it happening. And yet when the people spoke and they shared their stories, it had an impact. And if you have a, a story that you might think nobody cares about, I can tell you that's not true. Um, even people who you think might be set in their ways or might have a certain viewpoint because you have your own kind of biases toward them, like you might think, well, that person looks like that, therefore he or she thinks this. I would encourage you to just jettison that and don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to share your stories. We all learn from each other. It's not just a one-way street. And it's not just, you know, kind of bumper sticker kind of a thing. But I mean, if you don't speak, we don't hear. <laughs> and the one thing that's um, kind of a great equalizer is that um, social media gives you an opportunity to communicate and to connect very easily, very real. Um, you know, back during the Vietnam War, I was a very, very young child. <laughs> like very, very young, where I wasn't really even paying attention to the TV. Um, even though I do have a recording of Nixon's resignation speech, because I got my little tape recorder out, I knew that was important. <laughs> but, um, you know, the reason why the Vietnam War, how that shook people was media. I mean, it was the news cameras getting out there and talking about people actually dying in war. Like people knew people died in war. That wasn't anything new, but just the depiction of it and the way that they got it. And it was like first person accounts and point, kind of point of view type of filming and everything. It, and it came into people's living rooms every night and it really shaped American view toward that. And I think, you know, we've seen the power of, you know, videos, uh, whether it's police interaction with civilians, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's, a kid hugging another kid, like running up to give a hug. Like we all have shared those experiences. And so I would encourage you, if you have an experience, it doesn't have to be negative, <laughs> it can be positive. Um, 
don't be afraid to share it with others. And I think to listen, not only to share your own experience, but be willing to listen to somebody else. That's mm -hmm. what I have noted in the last decade or more is that we've, we've stopped listening to each other. We've taken our positions, we've gone to our corners and some folks fight to the death for that position or just don't talk about it at all. And, and I, that is not the way to move forward. I totally agree with Judge Koch. You have to speak up and you have to share your own positions, but you also have to listen to others and be willing to be flexible in your position. Judge Koch mentioned the Vietnam War. You know, for our generation, the old guys in the, in the room here, that was a defining event in our lifetimes. And right now in 2020, <laughs> I can't list the number of defining events in your lifetime. This year and perhaps the years, you know, a couple years before, a couple years after, this is going to be the defining moments of your generation, quite frankly. Um, and there are so many current things. I'm so excited about your generation. I truly am. Because when I talk, like the, the other folks on the panel here talk with young folks, um, they're so enthusiastic. And, and some things that, that we, the older generation, fought for, it comes second nature to them. I mean, you talk about same-sex marriage, just as one example. That was unthinkable 40 years ago. And look at today, how, how many same-sex marriages have I performed? And it, it's a joy every single time because you can change that by working within the system. Um, ironically, I just watched a, a Matter of Sex last night, which is the Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one of the many Ruth Bader Ginsburg movies. Mm -hmm. If you get a chance, watch it. But Within that, she talks about working within the system, not breaking down the system. You know, I, ironically, the night before I watched the Chicago Seven, <laughs> talk about two different groups of people. I mean, the Chicago Seven, most of them were there to break down the system and cause anarchy. Whereas turning our attention to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she actually worked within the system to change. Um, she and, did it in a very unique way, though. Like, I mean, yeah. she was advocating for women's rights by advocating for men. Like, I mean, it was like that's what started it. Exactly. Yeah, she was she was pretty crafty at how she. But she, what she did was, and speaking of that, what she did was she plotted a plan. Yeah. She knew that this is what needed to be changed. She knew that there had to be equal rights for every citizen in this country, and so she, given her incredible intelligence, mm -hmm. um, plotted a plan and picked certain cases to argue and to bring up through the uh, federal court system to the Supreme Court to make that change. And yes, it did take her 30 years or more to do it. But in the long run, she made the change that, that she wanted to. In fact, one of the things that was pointed out in the movie, there was the exhibit A in the, in the state's brief which was a listing of all of the statutes that were gender-based. And there were, back in 19, what would it have been, 68 maybe, 69, there mm. were hundreds and hundreds of statutes that were gender-based. It <clears throat> not treat people equally. She picked out every single one of them and went to work on every single one of them. And so, and <laughs> turning our attention to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I mean, she didn't, she did start at Harvard Law School. She was married. She had a child. She was going to law school in the middle of law and her husband was one year ahead of her in law school. Her husband got cancer. She not only went to her own classes, she went to her husband's classes. She grad, she left Harvard Law School and went to Columbia because it was, um, a bit easier for her to go to Columbia than it was to Harvard. She graduated from Columbia Law School and she became a professor because she couldn't get a job because she was a woman lawyer. And so that is what spurred her on to changing these laws. She was just as good or quite frankly, a whole lot better than any man. And 
but she was held back by the law. And so turning our attention currently, there are so many issues that you can get involved in. I mean, I've just wrote voter suppression, gun laws, term limits, environment, police accountability. I mean, it's just, there's so many things that if you feel really excited about and really engaged in, then get involved. And, and I'll tell you one brief little story, a personal note. About 10 years ago, I literally died and came back to life. I was brought back to life in the emergency room. To say it was a, a life-changing experience, it's, it was. And it taught me, one thing that I took from that experience is number one, I hate to be morbid, but you know we have a life expectancy. We have a, a shelf life. And so what I thought to myself, you know, when I do leave this earth, what have I done? Literally, what have I done to make this a better place? Have I just made money, had kids, you know, lived in a house with a white picket fence and a golden retriever? What have I done to help society to make this place that I leave behind a better world? And that's what I'm asking each and every one of you to do, is to search your souls and to think about what you can do to make this world a better place. Judge Smith? So the thing, the one thing that I, I want to um, add to the, uh, to the equation here, um, and it's very much related uh, to, to what uh, everyone else has said, um, and that is this, you know, you have a myriad of things, myriad of issues that um, you can be involved in. Um, and wherever your passion may lie, that's where you should, where you should go. Um, but I think you should spend the time to keep yourself well informed um, of the issues that are um, relevant, not only to you and your local community, but it helps to have some understanding of what is going on uh, nationally and even uh, in other parts of the world, because in part, I think that also helps you to appreciate um, uh, the things that we do have here in this country. It's not perfect by any means, um, but there are so many um, issues that uh, need your attention. Um, and, you know, I often say, so I have two daughters. And uh, my, <clears throat> my youngest daughter, we often refer to her as the social warrior as she was coming up. Um, and she was the, the one that would usually be involved in the protest um, <laughs> in more than one. Uh, and um, she just had such a passion for um, injustices and, and wanting to do something about that. And I tell you, uh, as I often do, uh, she is one of the smartest people um, when it comes to being well-informed. I mean, she will engage with anyone um, as that relates to local politics, national politics, world affairs, feminist issues. And she always, she's always throwing this theory and all of these things out at me. We have great conversations because of that, because I know that she is so well informed at such a high level. Um, and that has always been the case, uh, even when she was younger and, and it, it goes forward here today. Um, so I, I, I would say to you, that's a part of um, preparing yourself to go out into the world and help to make a change is making sure that you take the time to educate yourself uh, about the issues that um, uh, are relevant to you, but also those that may be relevant, relevant to um, you know, a broader segment of our uh, community as well as um, world issues. I mean, all of that stuff is relevant. That's I'm, glad I'm, that, I'm glad you raised educate yourself because I had written that down. And that's something that I think all of us in the legal profession, we like to think that we 
educate ourselves about the law and, yeah. and what it is, but um, too often people have opinions without having the facts behind it. Right. <laughs> that, that's really disappointing. If you're in court right. and you try to like bluff your way through an argument without having the law or the facts, you just look kind of foolish. Right. Um, in our civil lives, um, <clears throat> our civic lives, we, we oftentimes lead with our opinions <laughs> instead of understanding the facts. So I think that that's, that's really an important thing. Aya, any yeah, your generation, Aya, you're younger than the three of us. Um, you know, where do you see your generation in civic engagement? Um, I mean, I think millennials kind of are, I, I don't know. I, I mean, there's an extent to which I feel like we're stuck in between generation X and like their, the complacency of that and like the fire, like the on fireness of <laughs> Generation C. Um, and I think that there, I mean, there are people all along the spectrum in there, but I think that, um, I don't know. I mean, I think my generation, I think is the first to kind of, to fully grow up in a time where it's post Watergate, post Vietnam and we grew up in a, in a time where it's like, it is, it is normal and expected to question authority and to question what's going on legally and to question, you know, the powers that be. And I think that that's like, we're the first generation to actually have that completely, you know? And I think- Why is that? I, I, think, I think it's because we, we can't, I, I think, I mean, the break in American society with, um, with kind of like what it means to be a patriot. I think that that shifted with Vietnam and Watergate, like that was the breaking point. And so obviously the generation that, the generation and generations that lived that had a very different experience. But for me coming up, it was, you know, it was expected that you have like, I don't know, people throw around like, like conspiracy theories about the government, <laughs> like as if, you know, it's nothing. And so, I mean, it's- They're not, True. They're not all true. <laughs> right, they're not all true, but like, but you know, but I think that's kind of, you know, that's the that's the starting the starting point is like, we don't have this assumption that you know things are are worked out, things are completely fine on like a broad scale. Obviously, generations before that in oppressed communities and disenfranchised communities had that same feeling all the time, right? Like, you're not going to say that, for example, the black community you know, felt like everything was fine before Vietnam. Like, that's obviously not true. Um, but I think that in the general zeitgeist, in the general kind of, you know, um, uh, kind of mainstream thought, I think that our generation was kind of the first generation to really just be born into that. Well, and I, I graduated high school before Aya, I'm sure, <laughs> by at least a decade and more, right? But when I graduated high school, which was 1981, <clears throat> um, there was a guy under my class who wore a t-shirt, like his favorite t-shirt was Question Authority. He was one person out of a class of 125. And the other 124 would look at Fred and be like, oh, there's Fred, <laughs> like Question <laughs> Authority, you know? And I think now the Question Authority would be much more the 124 than the one. And that's where the education comes into play. That's where the sharing of stories comes into play. That's where if you see something that's an injustice, you are more empowered, I think, today than in the past to say something. And to see you, you have to work through the system to change the system. Well, I, I mean, there's two you have to I, don't, I I think that there's advantages to both. Um, what I would encourage people to do. Um, well, uh, let me segue to another point I was going to make and then maybe come back to what you were just asking. Um, I have a feeling that if we took a poll of the four people here on the screen, that all four of us would say that our views of the world and different things have changed since high school. Because we've all had other experiences that have helped inform us and form how we look at things. Um, I know in high school, I was very confident in my views on things. I thought I was educated on things, mm -hmm. but I was educated in a certain way 
in a <coughs> complete way. And I think going to college and having a, a more diverse group of friends and things like that, you just, you learn more from osmosis and from talking. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage everyone to don't be just comfortable with what's comfortable for you. Kind of become comfortable with the uncomfortable. <laughs> Go and check mm -hmm. things out and kind of explore things. And I'm not, I am kind of an institutionalist, getting back to your question, uh, Judge Analyst. I believe generally in institutions. I think that um, it doesn't mean we can't improve <clears throat> them, but that there is some, and not, not stability and not safety. Those are the wrong connotations there. But there's kind of a, a longer view. It doesn't mean we can't make quicker progress, <laughs> but it, it doesn't mean that you have to destroy everything that's there in order to accomplish what you want. But to live within a civil society, Judge Smith, do you think that we need to work through our institutions and improve them or change them as opposed to well, overthrowing those institutions and starting over again. You know, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, that, that, <laughs> that is a really big question. And I will say this, it, it really depends on your vantage point, where you sit. Um, because I can tell you there are, um, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of black folks, a lot of, uh, Po folks who look at the systems and and will say in a heartbeat, "Hey, look, the system is not working for me." And um, you know, I, I mentioned at the outset that we are in this period of social upheaval, and uh, you know, for those that are old enough, uh, we understand we've been here before. I tell people right now with some of the some of what's going on and the uh, momentum that I see behind this, the momentum for the, the, the possibility of change, real substantive changes seems to be there. But I am cautiously optimistic because it feels like a repeat, even though there is, there's, there does appear to be greater buy-in now from a larger segment of our society. And my hope is that um, this desire for change will be sustained in a way that um, will, will actually bring about some real systemic changes for a large segment of our population that have just been left out. And so to, to answer your question, <laughs> like I said, it depends on your, your vantage point, um, you know, and, and I have the benefit, look, I've had, I, I, and I still do to this day, I walk in two different worlds. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I grew up, I, I had a very unique childhood in the sense that I spent the first half of my life living in different countries in many different states. So I knew the world was bigger than just me. However, when my father got out of the military, I ended up in the projects, which are, you know, just a bastion of, of poverty. And so I, I saw the world from very different perspectives um, at a very early age. And that's how I lived my childhood. And so those experiences are still with me. Um, and, 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 you know, I am blessed to be where I am now but I don't forget where I came from. And, um, you know, so, so again, there's, real, there's a real need for systemic change. And, and, and um, if we can do it, I mean, yeah, ultimately I don't wanna see, I don't wanna see us in an, in an anarchy, right? Um, but, but we have to, people have to be, the, the people that are in power have to be willing to, buy into the notion that real change joy um you know what this what this country is supposed to be about okay well winnie had popped in here which means that we're <laughs> it's a much deeper conversation yeah. it is it is well with that um 
I would like to thank all of you profusely. Um, if there is one thing um, that I have taken from this, I mean, I've taken many, many things, um, but if there is one mm -hmm. overarching thought, it is um, for everyone who listens to this civic engagement um, session to be inspired, to become well-informed, to speak and to listen but do so with respect, with patience, welcome constructive thoughts, recognize that there are people from all walks of life with all experiences. And even if they look exactly the same as you, they very much could have experienced something else or maybe going through something else internally. So, so be eager to learn and to support one another. Um, with the words of one woman uh, who we've been mentioning many times today, who we will all have the honor of admiring as we continue with our careers and watch you grow into yours. Let us remember her words that all of us revere the institution or for everyone here today, really the, the world for which we work and live in. And we want to leave it in as good of shape as we found it but I think and I challenge you to leave it in an even better place. We very much look forward to seeing you all this season and thank everyone on this call for their time, their energy and their expertise. And thank be kind to one another. Please be yes. kind to one another. <laughs> be kind. Yes, thank yes. you. <laughs> all right, thank all right. you all so much. All right, take all care right. folks. Yep, thank bye -bye. you. It was nice to see you all. All right, you as well. Bye-bye.